Welcome to the backstory on justice in Longmont. My name is Tim Waters, and as a volunteer for Longmont Public Media, I enjoy the opportunity to interview leaders, policymakers, decision makers, activists in the community on topics of interest and relevance to the community. And this, and this morning, I have the good fortune of interviewing four of the principal leaders in Longmont's Community Justice Partnership is focused on schools and what does restorative justice look like in our schools. So, welcome to the panel this morning, uh, to uh, Kathleen McGoy, who is the director, to Officer Stacy Stallings, who is our school resource officer and a champion of community justice or restorative justice in the partnership in our schools, to Abby Winkler, a graduate of Silver, Silver Creek High School in Shenandoah, Wa, who is a rising junior at Silver Creek High School. Now, those are insufficient introductions, but those are at least your names. Now I'm going to ask you to tell the viewers of this a little bit more about yourselves. Let's start. Kathy, we'll start with you. Go to Stacy, Abby, and Shenandoah. Tell us about who you are and how you got into this. Yeah, thanks so much, Tim. I, I appreciate your invitation to have us on the podcast. For me, in, in 2012, I moved to Boulder to finish writing my master's thesis. And prior to that, I had been studying and working in international peace building for about nine years. So in my writing, I was really focused on this approach to piecework called conflict transformation, which says that conflict is something natural that's always going to happen between humans but when we approach it a certain way it can be an opportunity for growth and new perspective and ultimately transformation of everyone involved instead of seeing conflict as an external problem that we can solve and then it'll magically go away forever so when i discovered restorative justice i thought oh this is it this is conflict transformation that has the power to both change individuals' lives and change systems. Did you finish that master's degree? <laughs> I did finish the master's degree and my thesis got published as a book. So it's out there in the world. And yeah, then I, I started volunteering here at Longmont Community Justice Partnership. And I, after two months of volunteering, I became a bilingual case coordinator and then eventually became the executive director. Yeah, well, I was in, I was in education too long to not want to know the end of that story about, about your, your master's thesis. Stacy, tell us about you. Or Officer Stallings, tell us about you. I should. Uh, that, that's you okay. Stacy is just fine. Um, I have been with Longmont PD for, I, I actually, they just had my 13 year anniversary. So I've been here for 13 years as an officer, started out on patrol, and then in 2014, went into the school resource officer assignment at Silver Creek. Um, prior to being a police officer, I, I didn't have any experience in law enforcement other than my occasional personal contact with police officers, you know, like, like normal, but, um, and and not always through great decisions to be honest so you know i i kind of had a, a wide variety of experiences there um you know before that i was kind of trying to find what what i still wanted to be and 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 i had this idea that i needed to wait until i was a responsible adult to make those kind of decisions and that just came later in life for me um so I didn't start this career until I was 32. So um, since being an SRO at Silver Creek, uh, well, let me back up. I got involved with restorative justice and introduced to restorative justice. I'd never heard of it in my life before becoming an officer. I don't remember hearing anything about it in academy, in police academy. Um, and then when I got to Longmont and we had our orientation, 
when we were brand new officers, we have a month of orientation before we go into our field training program. And that's when I learned about restorative justice. And that was when uh, LCJP would come and give us, you know, little two hour training sessions in our orientation. And, and then I referred a, maybe a couple of cases when I was a new officer. And the first time I sat in on a community group conference, um, I was hooked. And I thought this is this, that was amazing. I have never walked out of a courtroom, to be honest with you, after testifying and thought that was amazing. Um, so to me that uh, I, I felt transformed as an officer and I could see that the transformative process that was happening between, you know, the, the referred, the responsible parties and the harmed parties that were involved. And, and, uh, I wanted to do more of that. And so when the opportunity came up that I could be a liaison with LCJP, that's a collateral duty that the police department offers on occasion when there's openings, uh, I, I took that opportunity and have been involved ever since and, you know, just kind of been trying to push education out and refer, you know, cases when I can to restorative justice and learning more about it. And now, you know, implementing it in a high school is, you know, I'm learning more about how, how it integrates and how to, um, almost more of the business side of it. You know, instead of just being the referring officer who gets the, to who gets to sit in the conference and enjoy the benefits, um, so I've got to learn more of like the front end work of restorative justice, which has been eye opening and and you know I've grown a lot. I think learned a lot, and I'm hoping we get to continue. Uh, we're we're going to drill down. <clears throat> you you made reference to some of the activities. We're going to drill down on those and. In just a minute, because I think that's an important part of the story. What the, you know, how does it unfold? But Abby, tell us about you. Um, I was connected, like reconnected with her. So through Stacy, I found out that she had started the restorative justice program um, in, in the school, and that's how I started my training with LCJP and. Um, not more involved with that, and I had previously some experience in the criminal justice system. I was a, um, I testified as a witness for a criminal case, and really just kind of saw um, the negative sides of our criminal justice system, um, and how uh, it, un unsatisfactory the process was for um, both parties of the case, and once I was introduced to restorative justice, it really opened my eyes that there were other opportunities out there and that there was a much healthier way of approaching of, of approaching uh, systems of conflict so um that was kind of my whole uh, beginning to it and um i never sat on a case specifically um at the school but i was still involved in volunteering and providing resources and stuff like that um and have been continuously involved in as a community member through LCJP, and now I'm actually on um, the National Youth Committee for um, the National Restorative Justice Conference. Okay, so, and Abby, you're a, a Silver Creek High School graduate. Where are you going to school now? I'm now at um, Colorado Mesa University studying chemistry. I'm going to be a junior this year. All right. Shenandoah, tell us about you. Um, so I was first introduced to restorative justice in my freshman year at Silver Creek. Um, and we learned about it in just our basic health class. And it sounded pretty interesting to me, but I hadn't had any interaction with it, with any of the harmed parties or the referred parties or anything like that um, until my sophomore year where um, I ended up being in this conflict with one of my friends where I was the responsible party and she was the harmed party. And going through the process of restorative justice was just so much more satisfying and more just involved for both parties. And I really felt like my side of the story was understood by the harmed party. And I really feel like I understood where the harmed party was coming from in that meeting. And I feel like I learned a lot more from the process than I would have if it was just a regular write up and went on and went on. Um, and so I continued that involvement in restorative justice by training to be a community member. And um, I have not participated as a community member yet in the meeting, but I am 
list and I'm ready to participate whenever a meeting comes up. So uh, just to put a, a, a contemporary frame around the frame, right? We're talking about restorative justice in schools. In the larger context of our, not just the American society, but globally, to, in, during the context of this, or in the, the moment of this interview for this podcast, uh, questions about justice, what it is and what it isn't and how we achieve it, it is uh, I, in my lifetime, I'm an old man, I don't think I've ever experienced the kind of intensity and attention that questions of justice and balance and fairness and equity uh, have, have ever been as, as uh, intense or as relevant or as important as they are right now. So when you hear a police officer talk about that was amazing or that was transformative, and you talk and you hear from um, Stacy and, and Abby talking, or from Shenandoah and Abby talking about uh, what, what there was to learn and what was satisfying in the pursuit of justice. Those don't, that language isn't used very often today, at least in the contemporary rhetoric about policing, enforcement, the pursuit of justice. So now we need to drill down on how do we get to the place where people have those experiences characterized by that kind of language. Kathleen, tell us about how, what is restorative justice? How does it play out in schools? And we'll talk in another podcast about how it plays out in the community. And why should, why should the community of Longmont care about this? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that great question. So at its core, um, what you've already heard referenced by, by Shenandoah, Abby, and Stacy is that Restorative justice in its essence is a framework to bring together those who are responsible for crime, who have caused harm, with those who have been impacted or harmed. So in the criminal justice system, we use the terms offenders and victims. And in the re restorative framework, we use referred or responsible person and then the harmed person. And the unique angle of restorative justice is that we not only introduce the directly harmed individual, but also members of the community that have also been impacted by an incident. And we give those people, the directly and indirectly harmed individuals, a central role in what needs to, be, what needs to happen to create justice. And the responsible person is expected to take responsibility, to be held accountable for the harms that they have caused. So in Longmont, what that looks like is our law enforcement officials, police officers working in any department, so school resource officers, patrol officers, detectives, are all able to make direct referrals to restorative justice upon learning more from the involved individuals, the harmed and responsible parties. And they can make that direct referral instead of writing a ticket or making an arrest. So it's a complete diversion around the criminal justice system. They are looking for those, those primary criteria. Is the person who caused the harm or was the offender taking responsibility for their actions? And is the harmed person okay with the case not going to court? If those two criteria are met, then the officer can make a referral to LCJP or the school's version can look slightly different than this, but LCJP can play a supporting role. And then the case gets matched with two trained facilitators. Those facilitators will meet with each harmed and responsible person separately before bringing them together with trained volunteer community members. That was the role that Shenandoah referenced and what we call a community group conference. And in that community group conference, along with the officer and the involved parties, the facilitators um, and the community members, those are all the, the folks present, we talk about what happened, who was affected and how, and what can be done to repair the harmed relationships. So following that group meeting, the responsible person will have a contract, usually with three to five specific actions that they can take to both repair the harmed relationships, give back to the community, and also demonstrate learning, that they've learned something that will influence their decisions moving forward. 
And if they complete their contract, then they won't have any criminal record from that incident. If they don't complete the contract or they reoffend while under con contract, then the case goes back to the referring officer. So in, in Longmont, I would say if you, if you care about giving victims and community members a voice in justice, then, then you care about this program. And if you care about keeping uh, offenders out of the system by holding them accountable and offering them a way to learn from their choices, then you care about this program. And finally, in the context that we're in right now, if you care about giving police more tools to do their job and bringing them together with community to create a sense of respect and accountability, then you care about restorative justice. We're gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna follow up on this with both you and Officer Stonings in terms of cost and benefits, because I because there's an economic side to this as well as a human and social side, and I think it's important. You know, and I to the degree that you can talk about that in just a minute, uh, but I do want to shift this conversation to, to, to Officer Stonings, because uh, what you just did was give us a new way to think about justice, not as vengeance, not as retribution, not as not as enforcement for the purpose of being punitive not incarceration, justice uh, defined very differently. And uh, I'm guessing that might have something to do why uh, an officer would, would go into this experience and use words like amazing and transform. And if there was ever a time when we'd like to hear our, our law enforcement, our, our frontline police officers have more amazing transformative experiences, it's right now. As the, as the father of a son who was on the job for eight years, um, I have some idea of how tough, from a, as a family member, how tough it must be today for, for our police officers. So Officer Stellings, talk about what does this mean as an alternative, uh, as, as options, as tools for policing in ways that pursue justice in ways that Kathleen has, has presented? Well, I would say that it's, I mean, you know, just like all of our other tools, it has to be the appropriate tool for the situation, of course. And, and, and I think everyone, wherever you stand on these issues, can agree that um, it, it, it's, it probably doesn't work for everything. And um, there are the key criteria. I kind of think that one, one roadblock that we consistently run into when we're um, when I am wanting to make a, a, a referral to restorative justice or, I, or I'm wondering why we aren't using it more, why we can't use it more. And I think something that comes up fairly regularly it, that, that I run into is that so many people don't take accountability. And that's a key piece to you know being able to have the restorative justice use the restorative justice practices instead of the traditional criminal justice system and and i think that that's kind of something that has happened over many years and and you know that's one of your constitutional rights to remain silent and we're kind of taught you know and especially now that's even coming out more don't talk to the police don't um, don't admit things, you know, it kind of depends on what how you were brought up. But so many times, I mean, I've even heard parents at at the school say, don't talk to them. Not just me as an SRO, but you know, administrators, the principal or assistant principal, don't talk to them, don't write anything down, don't and so unfortunately I think that's something that that we have to work on as a society is is it being the um the okay thing to do to accept to take responsibility for our actions and yes there may be consequences and i'm you know being willing to handle or deal with those consequences and and make things right so that's i think one of the biggest problems that uh we run into as police officers is that being just such a it's a it doesn't it doesn't work without that piece and so we can't use restorative justice more often if if people don't do that but um, you know, as in terms of the positive things about restorative justice, that we could truly change our relationship with our communities nationwide, is this is very unique. I don't, I don't know 
if you know that, Tim. Uh, I mean, there in very, very few places in the country are police officers allowed to make a direct referral to restorative justice and have this tool in their tool belt. So we're we're very fortunate here, and that we're able to use that. But and and it just gives us more options because sometimes it's not. You know, you've got some some someone you're dealing with who is is showing remorse and they're you know upset about what they did and they're taking responsibility for it. They're wanting to make it right right then, but maybe the victim in the situation is like, no, I'm not just going to accept an apology and call it a day. Like you know, I'm upset, whatever the the crime may be. So you know, we have to take some action. But is that someone that now I'm going to have to you know, charged with a felony because this victim does want to see some kind of justice. And, um, you know, I always have discretion as an officer, but the victim has one of the loudest voices that we should be listening to. And um, so oftentimes we do follow that their lead on what they wish to happen. And that's kind of one of the other components that we, we see as a roadblock sometimes. Sometimes as officers, we want to make a referral to restorative justice and we think it's perfect, perfectly appropriate and would be very successful, but sometimes we can't get the victims to um, agree to that. So there's ways around that too, but um, I have now gone off on a whole different side <laughs> note there. So if you want to redirect me or if I didn't quite answer that, let me know. Actually, uh, most people who spend any time around me know that's where, that's I spend most of my life going off on tangents. So <laughs> now, you got Good. you got lots of degrees of freedom in, in these in this conversation. Uh, Abby and Shenandoah, um, it's one thing to talk about this. There's something else to it, uh, uh, assign meaning and value to it in schools. Why do you think this is important for? your contemporaries and your and the institution, your schools. As you, we heard Officer Stallings talk about this, this uh, uh, concern about, you know, don't speak to any adult, right? Or don't speak to the administrators. Having been a high school principal and a discipline officer myself, that'd be too tough to do your job if your students won't talk to you um, or talk to uniformed police officers or anybody who's in authority. Talk about how this plays out or why it plays out and it's so important in your schools and to your contemporaries. I really think that <clears throat> when we're looking at schools, uh, that Stacy's right, like there's a level of education. Uh, a lot, you know, high schoolers are young and likely haven't had a lot of experience with um, any sort of a justice system. And when you're especially looking at um, a high school level age age group, you're looking at a lot of kids who um, just don't come. It's, it's a very, I mean, in our society in general, we have a very individualistic um, approach to what how we um, view the world. I feel like we're all kind of raised to be like um, every man fend for himself. I feel, and so in the um, in high schools, when you're looking. When you're lacking that sort of educational component, how do you bring that in? How do you realize um, that you have uh, what your actions do affect other people? But sure, maybe if you um, get into a disagreement with somebody uh, or, you know, are, are causing some sort of alternative horror, you know that you're harming somebody directly, but you don't realize that that has ripple effects. And um, especially when we're looking at bringing up our youth, it's important to be able to identify that and to be able to educate on those purposes. And when we're looking at restorative justice in these age groups, it's so preventative almost, you know, if we can get to the source of the problem now, you can stop future problems. And I feel like restorative justice is such a good way to tackle those sorts of problems um, and to help provide a real resolution when it comes to um, youth development in, in our schools. Jenna Dewey, would, would you like to add to that? I'm sure, I hope yeah. you Yeah, yeah, um, I definitely agree with Abby that it does help you see the ripple effects. It's not just you against one person or one person against you. It affects everybody in the community and in the school in small ways that you might not even think about. Um, and I also think it's a really important way to kind of educate the rest of the community on like how these issues actually affect students. For example, 
in my freshman year in my health class, we had somebody who was under a restorative justice contract who had to talk about what happened in their incident and then talk about how they kind of fixed that and how restorative justice helped them kind of right the wrongs that they had committed. And then when I was um, the referred party, one of my contract items was also to present to a few classes and kind of talk about the issue and have students not only at Silver Creek, but in the wider community. So I think it's a really great way to kind of educate everybody involved and kind of, like Abby said, stop the incidents in the high school formative years where it's not as serious from going out into the wider community and becoming more serious issues. Uh, one of the, one of the um, I guess, values we promoted in schools for a long, long time is individualism, right? You do it on your own and you're gonna compete and, and it's, <laughs> it's less about the community and it's more about your achievements as an individual. It will be interesting in the post-pandemic world, given what we have learned about how, how critical our behaviors are in relationship to others, right? As simple as wearing a mask or not, right? We, that's why we're in vir virtual interview today, is because of the pandemic. Um, so this whole concept of I, my obligation and my accountability to others, uh, in some ways in the post-pandemic world, maybe that's defined a little differently than it was pre-pandemic, uh, when it was, I'll get mine and, you know, and to heck with anybody else. Uh, as, a, as a value, we seem to have promoted in many places, in many occasions, through our school system. And I was in it for decades, so, so I can say that firsthand. I'm not just a critic from standing outside the system. Uh, both Kathleen and Officer Stallings, th there's, a, there's a cost to this and a benefit to this. Um, creating the Longmont Community Justice Partnership, there's costs associated with this. There, there are costs associated, I would assume, for the police department to have officers in these roles and the time it takes. But there are also benefits, and I don't know if you can reduce those benefits to a dollar figure, but, I, but it would be helpful for you two, to hear from you two on what you see as costs and benefits, not just in schools, but in, you know, in, the, in the context of law enforcement generally. Kathleen, you want to begin? Sure, sure. I'll start that one out. And I'll, I just want to tag on briefly to the, the last question that the, the opportunity that we have in schools that I think all, all three of you refer to is to create a restorative culture. So when the culture changes, you know, away from this individualistic, every person for themselves towards we can all do better together, that also supports taking responsibility, right? Like if it's safe, if I know what's going to happen when I take responsibility for making a mistake or making a choice that hurt others, and I know that there, I'm gonna enter into this process that sees me as a human connected to a community, and that I'm gonna be given an opportunity to use my strengths to repair relationships with those that I've hurt, well, that starts encouraging a different level of responsibility to take place which then enhances respect in the building and especially when we're concerned right now with violence in schools it's more important than ever for students to feel a sense of belonging to that community oh i'm wanted here i have a chance to use my voice to talk about my experience and to be reintegrated into the school community even by the law enforcement officer you know the law enforcement officer is giving me this chance to say who I am and not be defined by this one act that could potentially send me to court, eventually to incarceration or suspension, expulsion, one of these other options. So I just wanted to make a note about the, the potential of changing the culture. For the costs and benefits question, so the primary benefit of restorative justice is that it is a public safety solution. So LCJP with a budget right now, we have a budget of around $500,000 a year and 200,000 of that does come from a contract with the city of Longmont. So with that budget, 
we serve hundreds of community members every year. We, we usually work on approximately 100 to 120 cases that involve somewhere around 200 responsible parties and anywhere between 60 to 100 harmed parties. Um, just to give you a comparison, in Colorado, it costs around $100,000 to incarcerate one youth for one year. So, of course, not all of the individuals coming through restorative justice would end up in incarceration. It's not an apples to apples comparison. But what we see is that if we invest in our youth and adults on the front end to keep them out of the system, we're ultimately saving a lot of money and a lot of taxpayer dollars on the other side of things. Because investing $100,000 to lock somebody up, we know is not going to really lead to the safety outcomes that we're hoping for. We also know that we have failed rates of recidivism once somebody is incarcerated. Um, for adults in Colorado, we have an almost 50% recidivism rate that adults leaving incarceration um, will reoffend and be reincarcerated within three years. So instead of doing this revolving door approach where we know people are going to come in and out draining community resources, why not invest on the front end? Um, and what we see, just to give you some stats, is 100% satisfaction from victims and harm parties suggesting that, or they report specifically to us that the responsible parties who go through restorative justice were held accountable for their actions. And in the, we, we recently completed a recidivism study that looked at 2,200 offenders who were referred to LCJP between 2006 and 2017. We saw a 3.5% re recidivism rate. So when we look at other recidivism rates that we hear about um, throughout this, this community and the country, that's a really low number. So we know that this works. Um, there's a huge benefit to operating as a nonprofit outside of the government, outside of an institution. Being a, a nonprofit allows, um, allows us to work alongside directly with the police so that they can make these what we call pre-file referrals, meaning no charges are ever filed against somebody taking responsibility. It also, I'll add one more benefit, which is that it really allows this to be a volunteer-driven approach. So we incorporate students like Abby and Shenandoah, and then we have it at our broader work at the nonprofit around 100 active volunteers at any time, um, making, this, making this intervention possible. Stacy, you want to add to this in terms of the both cost and benefits from the law enforcement perspective? It sounds like Kathleen wrapped it up pretty well. Um, I think as far as the benefits from the from a police perspective is um, we don't get I, I don't I don't think it's a secret that we don't get a lot of positive interaction with our community unless we are getting to do like a cops night out, you know, neighborhood barbecue, things like that, or or we really try to get involved in these community events. But but when we are called on a call because someone has called the police, that is not always a negative or a positive interaction and and, and and even as as kind as some I believe many Longmont police officers are and myself and as respectful as we try to be it doesn't always end up being just like you know it's not your best day and um, especially as the responsible party or the offender in that moment regardless of which direction they're taking so I think a, a huge benefit that I have noticed, and sometimes I have even told Kathleen this before, I'm like, sometimes I think restorative justice is the only thing that keeps me in this job. Um, mm. Because it gives me the opportunity to see beyond that person's actions, because in my job, all I see is people's actions and people doing, victimizing one another. Mm -hmm. And it's, it gets real hard, you know, to, what is the saying, to 
see the forest for the trees kind of thing because it, it gets it gets challenging to see people as people instead of their actions everywhere and when I get to sit in as an officer in a community group, group conference model I get to see there's more to that person than what they did and I get to see them not just taking responsibility for it but wanting to repair the harm and fix it and you know many times i i ask that the case coordinators communicate you know occasionally with me on the contract items and they usually let us know when an offender has completed their contract successfully and and sometimes that includes some kind of letter to to us or something if they come up with that for their contract item which we We'll end up seeing that and reading that too. And it, it kind of repairs the damage to us as police officers that happens in this job. That's how I feel. And so I think that that's a, a huge benefit that so many law enforcement agencies are missing out on by not being, not either having restorative justice in their communities at all and or not being involved in the restorative justice that's happening in their communities. So, so I, I think that we missed. Right. Well, I, it, for anybody at a job uh, where you, for the overwhelming majority of the time when you're interacting with somebody you're called to interact with, you're interacting with them on their worst day, uh, right. that's going to have a, that is going to have a serious impact over an extended period of time. So having other opportunities, obviously, uh, uh, is some of the balance that you'd like to achieve in your professional life. I'll just add one more kind of editorial comment. Um, for I, when I was in the field of education, uh, the kind of the cliche was uh, we ought to put more money into education because it costs way more to send kids to the state pen than it does to Penn State, right? Uh, and, and, and you just reinforced that, Kathleen, that uh that that this is we by by supporting whatever it takes financially for this kind of an approach we end up saving we're, it, we're able to redirect funds right to to other kinds of initiatives um and just with with that on that theme uh and i don't maybe you want to comment maybe not either kathleen or, or stacy on this we're, we're we're hearing a lot uh, when I when I leave my home today and drive down the street, I'll see signs about defunding the police department. I'll see it in the 24-hour news news uh, cycle. Um, and and I in my interview with Mike Butler uh, the, in this, in a backstory with Mike, um, we talked a little bit about uh, be be clear what you're asking for in the defunding of police departments, because if you defund police departments, you'd be defunding this initiative potentially, and the support that police officers need to be able to spend the time and engage in ways that Officer Stalling is describing. Is, is that fair? Absolutely. I think that, Kathleen, that's probably a, a better question for you since you're the, you deal with that kind of department. Sure, yeah. I, I would be very concerned if the Longmont Police Department were to be defunded and I think what, the community, the Longmont community specifically needs to know is the number of community-based initiatives that Longmont police officers are already committed to and have been developing. We've been doing restorative justice with police for 25 years. We've been doing the core program, the crisis and outreach Oh gosh, I'm going to get it wrong. Crisis and outreach response and engagement. There you go and lead the law enforcement assisted diversion program, I think those some iteration of those have been in place for six years. So when we hear about other communities demanding more types of intervention, hey, let's not ask police officers to be the experts in mental health crises, in de-escalating incidents on the street, in intervening when um, addiction and substance abuse is a problem, which is, uh, I think those issues contribute to the majority of police calls. And other communities around this country are saying, let's get more professionals with expertise in those areas involved in responding to those community needs. Longmont's already doing that. 
we already have those programs in place in partnership with law enforcement, which I'll say from my perspective has changed the culture of police in Longmont. They have these tools, the tools reinforce a different way of engaging with the community. You can't engage with the community if you don't have those tools. So I would be concerned, very, very concerned that we would be taking away options and tools from our officers. We would be placing more stress and more burden on them if we were to defund police. I do agree with what you said at the beginning about uh, the comments from Chief Butler that this is a nuanced conversation. It's very problematic to me when it's framed as this one or the other, it's us versus them. We need to have community members with diverse perspectives and voices along with officers sitting at the table when we talk about what we want to see in terms of public safety. Thanks. Uh, Abby and Shenandoah, uh, as, we, as we draw down on the last few questions in, in the, this podcast, uh, what are the messages you'd like to send uh, to your contemporaries, uh, to school administrators, to city council members, uh, to city staff, decision makers, or budget, you know, folks who prepare budgets. Whatever the, whatever the messages are, what would you like people to hear from you two who have practical experience on, on, uh, on, in all aspects of restorative justice in our schools? Um, no, I really think that when we're looking at a uh, long-term future and long-term health of our society, it would be great to um, just recognize that this creates empathy in our communities. You're looking at creating a, a more empathetic future and um, culture if you introduce these sorts of um, procedures into your um, school systems and into your education systems. What, I mean, wouldn't it be great if you, you could actually include students maybe in like circles with this administration? Let's get those voices, um, the people that you're actually teaching, in, in contact with administrators and in contact with um, uh, leaders and authority members. Like when you're um, talking about reaching the uh, educational populace, like you're not able to reach these people if you um, are stand behind that curtain. And restorative justice really helps break these boundaries down. And you're, along with your peers, and increasing the quality of relationships mm -hmm. with your peers, you can also um, really show that students have power and students have a voice. Um, but in, it's, it's a learning opportunity. It doesn't come off as punitive. Um, and I think that's really important for both sides. Um, instead of separating it, where you have adults versus kids, kind of a thing like that. You're able to incorporate all aspects of the school and uh, resources together. And I think that that would be something that should be incorporated, especially move for, moving forward. If we're talking about reform, this would be a great thing to include. You know, let's let's get more programs like this started. Let's, like Kathleen saying it, uh, in general, you know, maybe not for every case, but in general, it costs less if we are reallocating the funds and looking at how we're actually repairing harm to the community. Uh, I think it could be really uh, insightful, very insightful for our future going forward as a as for our future as a nation, so. Shenandoah? Uh, yeah, I definitely agree with Abby that it does create empathy in our society. And I think that restorative justice is really helpful, like Officer Selling said, in getting past the actions of certain individual individuals. So you often hear that you don't have all sides of the story. Well, restorative justice allows you to get all sides of the story. And it allows everybody there to kind of understand everybody's perspective and create ways to create justice that is satisfactory and amazing to everybody instead of just the regular justice system where justice is served in the form of the law, but it's not necessarily served and it's not necessarily satisfying for all the parties involved. So I think the main part of restorative justice that's important is that everybody's voice is heard and everybody gets a chance to kind of repair the harms that have been done and to repair the relationships. In my own experience, um, I got into a disagreement with a friend and before our restorative justice meeting, we were not talking and 
the relationship between us was really rocky, but now we've been able to repair that relationship and become friends again. So I think that's a really important part of restorative justice as well. Well, I know uh, I made reference to messaging to administrators. I know the administrators in your high school <laughs> heard the message and they've been involved in this. Hopefully administrators across the country will have a chance to hear that message. And if there's one word that jumps out over and over again, what you just said, that we've heard so much about recently, it's empathy and the need for more. Uh, coast to coast, top to bottom, uh, in every sector of this country. So um, I would invite Kathleen and Stacy, if there's any messaging that you want to do as well, uh, in addition to what we've already heard, any messages you'd like for decision makers, policy makers, uh, people building budgets to hear? Yes, sure. I'll, I'll go first. I'm chomping a little bit at this one. Uh, uh, you know, the, I think the, the loudest message that, that, that is sitting heavy with me at, in this time, in this climate and the, you know, discussion about the defunding and the uh, removing SROs and things like that from school is, um, you know, every, I think every organization, every city, every school district, it, it's not all the same everywhere. And, you know, at, at my school and in St. Fran and working with LCJP and at the Longmont Police Department, you know, restorative justice at Silver Creek would not exist without the SRO. And, um, it, and not saying that at some point, maybe someone, uh, some staff member or administrator might get some training or a counselor or something like that, say, hey, we should try this and try building this. But, um, you know, I think that there's a huge opportunity being being missed in, in our country of utilizing resources as in terms of lot SROs specifically using restorative justice in schools so they can we can be there for safety we can be there for the bigger more 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 serious crimes where people are at risk their safety is at risk and and it could be imminent at times so we are there and we are present but we're constantly using this model of restorative justice in the school to deal with discipline issues or crimes that, I mean, they are, you know, by letter of the law, they're crimes and dealing with those so we, so that we can be present to build these relationships with our, with our kids and teach them life skills that they get to carry with them forever and not contribute to the school of the prison pipeline and, you know, teach them how to have this, this culture, this, this culture of ownership and inclusion with with their with all of their peers there you know um so i get pretty passionate about that and i think that um my message would be more for um that you know here we are in this time where we're talking about defunding the police and so that the police have to set aside this this money to contribute to the community program so the police can't necessarily or the cities can't necessarily pay for restorative justice within every school district in their city or across the state and so i think school districts um could really benefit from uh helping to fund um, those those programs within their schools and I think that they would see a huge improvement I think it would improve on attendance and behavior issues you know if we're not suspending kids then the attendance goes up which means they are having they are sitting in classrooms and you know potentially learning more and being more successful in school if they're actually present so there's just so many ways again that it would benefit if we could invest some in these types of practices in our schools and then just have better more positive relationships with staff and all the students of all of these different walks of life that are in the hallways that's one thing i always explain to to the kids is you know where they ask why they have so many roles in school why are there so many roles and i always ask them where where in your life are you going to be trapped in the same building that you're required to be in by law for seven hours a day with 1,400 other people who could be completely and, and separate from you and your and your views and values and everything, different religions, different races, different ages, interests, political views, everything. I mean, all ends of the spectrum. 
and then we you guys have to get along mm -hmm. i have to make sure you get along all day or we all have to make sure you get along all day and every now and then a student will say um jail and i'm like <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> you know i mean even your employers you tend mm -hmm. to kind of gravitate towards you know certain fields because you have common interests and, and values and things like that so it's just a very unique place and i think that it's such a a great fit for restorative justice to be integrated into that system early on. Kathleen? Yeah. Anything to add in terms of messaging? Well, Stacy covered a lot of ground there, which I really, really appreciate. And I would say, you know, we, one of the reasons that restorative justice has been able to serve thousands and thousands of community members in Longmont is thanks to the investment of not only Longmont Public Safety, but also the St. Brain Valley School District, which has prioritized training for educators and administrators in restorative approaches. And what that's allowed LCJP to do is grow to this point where right now we are really ready to provide even more services and focus on our relationships with school resource officers. Um, we right now could, could do more and we have secured funding from foundations and donors to support the expansion of our programming, but we will be limited in that expansion if we lose funding from the city. So I would say if if policymakers and decision makers are interested in seeing more restorative justice that has been described in this interview, I would ask them to please find ways to prioritize funding of this community-based initiative. Kathleen, just build on, on that part of this as we wrap up with, if, if anybody who listens to this would like to learn more about how to get involved or is motivated to get involved, how do they get involved? Yeah, thanks so much for asking that, Tim. So the best way to get involved is, of course, to visit our website, which is lcjp.org. And we have a monthly orientation, which we're currently hosting over Zoom. The next one is July 13th from 6 to 8. We do have one in, we have one this month in June, but it's already full to capacity. So you're welcome to go to our website to look at um, trainings and events and you can sign up directly for our orientation there and that's the first step towards learning more about everything that we do and how to get involved we also have a documentary that was made in just 2019 um, about our restorative justice police partnership you will see all three of these individuals on the screen with me featured in the documentary and the filmmakers in light of what's been going on throughout the country recently with violence, um, the filmmakers have just released the documentary publicly. So we'll be linking that on our website this week to make it more broadly available. Outstanding. I wanna say thanks to all four of you, Shenandoah, Abby, Officer Stallings, Kathleen, thank you so much for giving us this time and for telling, sharing the backstory on restorative justice in schools with Longmonters. Uh, we will, we're going to continue this conversation. There'll be another backstory, talk about how this applies and what the implications are for the community. But I want to thank all four of you this morning. You could have done a lot of different things with your time. The fact that you chose to spend it with me in this podcast uh, is a service in and contribution to the community. Thanks and be safe. Take care of yourselves. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having us. Right, Thank bye -bye. you.